Hello, uh, welcome to Chatham House. I was having a nice chat with Amy Walter about Omaha. Um, I can see that we are preparing for what will be a very interesting conversation today, um, The just a few hours after the second um, GOP debates took place uh, in uh, California. Um, I'm Leslie Benjamora. I direct the US and America's program here at Chatham House. Um, we are preparing for what we know will be quite an interesting year and a bit, um, looking always at the United States from a perspective that's uh, intentionally considering uh, the implications for the rest of the world. But today we have some tremendous um, thinkers, scholars, analysts to help us understand the state of U.S. politics and especially the Republican Party uh, and the direction of travel. Um, I'm going to introduce them only briefly, but I would highly recommend that if you don't already know them and follow their work, it's it's well worth doing um, immediately. Amy Walter uh, is publisher and editor in chief of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. She is, I would say by now, a friend of Chatham House, having uh, spoken with us in the past several times. She is a regular also on PBS NewsHour as a political analyst. Um, and on many major news stations. Uh, and so if you're following um, US politics, you will know her really excellent uh, analytical work. Um, Professor Larry Sabato is at the University of Virginia. He is founder and director of the Center for Politics, very well known for his writings, for his many books, most recently, A Return to Normalcy, the 2020 election that brackets almost broke America, it did not. Um, and, and also for uh, Crystal Ball, which again, I would direct your attention to, which is provides really great uh, commentary and analysis on US politics. He's been at this for a very long time and has tremendous historical mm -hmm. as well as contemporary knowledge. And Gideon Rockman, well known to all of us, chief foreign affairs commentator at the Financial Times, definitely a friend of Chatham House and Gideon, your most recent book, Age of the Strong Men, how, uh, how, how the cult of leadership has threatened democracy. And I know that you took a very close look at Donald Trump uh, in that book. So Amy, let me turn to you. Last night's debates gave us a lens into um, what we know to be um, a Republican party that looks very different than it looked um, when you and I were growing up in the United States. <laughs> Uh, it looks very different than it looked 10 years ago. Um, Donald Trump wasn't on the stage. I know from following you and 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 Larry from following you that you don't think the Washington Post um, ABC poll was very good. And that I think the, the average tells us that President Biden and President Trump, were they to actually uh, run for, for, for election today, would be neck and neck. Um, but Amy, tell us your analysis of both what you saw in the debate, but but more broadly, where you see um, us going over the next several months and and how how this is likely to unfold. What's the state of the Republican Party into your mind? Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Uh, always enjoy these conversations. Uh, if anybody took the time to watch the debate. I don't think you came out of it feeling very satisfied. It felt a little bit like uh, going to a buffet and filling up on, I don't know what, just carbs and about five minutes later, you feel like <laughs> you just got a lot of empty calories. Uh, the reality is that Donald Trump is the center of the, not just the political universe, but certainly is, the Republican Party right now. Um, he is the sun and everything else revolves around him. And so, you know, theoretically, conversations about policy, um, differences between the candidates on really big issues, certainly Ukraine being the top sort of uh, uh, rift between the party right now, uh, between members of that party right now, what to do uh, there and the continued U.S. aid to Ukraine. But we don't get into that because the conversation really is, do you stand with Donald Trump or do you not stand with Donald Trump? And if that is the measurement then for 
how to win a primary, uh, candidates are going to just go to where it's safe. And so uh, what we saw last night were a bunch of candidates who were basically desperate to cling on to whatever piece of the pie that they have, Donald Trump being ahead anywhere 40, 50 points, they maybe have a five point or six point, seven points in the polls, trying to be that second place candidate. And if Donald Trump falters, or if things get close, they can be the last one standing. And well, very hard for me to see that Donald Trump loses to one of them at this point. But should that happen, they want to be the next you know, they, they are in that second place slot. Um, I don't know that anyone did themselves a whole lot of help. Uh, I think we'll see if anybody actually watched that debate. I mean, to me, that's the bigger question is, are Republican voters even tuning in? Um, when we know that for so many of them, they feel pretty good about the idea of renominating uh, Donald Trump. As for the, the big picture, just I, I think what's really important if we're thinking about polls, to me, the, the number that stands out the most to me is one that came from Pew Research the other day uh, when they asked people how they feel about politics right now. And not surprising, you have a lot of disillusioned and disappointed Americans. But 65% said, when it comes to politics, just thinking about politics, it's exhausting to me. And this has been a pretty tumultuous last five years in the US when it comes to politics. People are burnt out, they're tired. They are seeing continued division and polarization. We've got economic challenges. We've got challenges in, you know, when it comes to really significant issues uh, on foreign policy as well as our own domestic policy regarding immigration. And they see just more fighting and finger pointing. And I think what this means is you've got a public that, especially for the swing voters, okay, let's forget the people who are Democrat, Republican, but for the people who decide elections, the people who aren't consuming politics day in and day out, they really are, not interested in staying engaged at this point. And so I have to appreciate that, that we can do a whole lot of polling right now, but the people that will matter the most in this election are, are pretty checked out and in some cases don't want to be checked in until they have to be. Amy, let me ask you a quick follow-up and then we'll come to you, Larry Sabato. Um, Tell, me, tell us who the swing voters are. How many are there? Yeah. Are, what sort of there, people are they? Just give us the kind of overview. There are uh, you want to know uh, 2 million, 167. <laughs> no, um, the, the great thing about swing voters is they're going to look different based on what state they're in, what, what we're talking about in terms of you know what's the top issue as we get into the fall of next year. Um, for, for Democrats, younger voters, voters of color, those are the voters that are critical to their coalition. They're also people that tend to tune in later into the process. They're not as engaged day in and day out on politics. They feel pretty disappointed uh, with a lot of what they're seeing in politics. They're not as attached to sort of traditional uh, party politics and the way we think about it. So that, that those groups are going to be very important. You've got suburban swing voters in some of these states, white voters who have been moving, white voters especially who fall into sort of a higher education, higher income bracket, who've been moving further toward Democrats over these last few years. Are they going to continue that? And then what about um, those voters who turn out for Donald Trump, but don't turn out for other Republicans, those ones who only seem to get engaged when Donald Trump is on the ballot. How are they feeling right now? So we're going to be paying attention to all those different groups. But as I said, each state is going to have a different group of swing voters that will be critical. 
Thank you. That's that's great. Um, Larry Sabato, your you you I'm sure have followed the, the first two debates. Um, your reactions and also your kind of overall take on the Republican Party and is, you know, is this as much as we can expect for quite a long time or do you imagine that there could be any number of things um, that change the state of play in unexpected ways? Well, that's a lot uh, <laughs> to cover in five minutes. I, I subscribe to what Amy said. I think she painted the picture very accurately. Uh, Amy, I have my own my own test as to whether people are interested in politics or tuning it out. It's my cocktail party a test. When I go to a cocktail party, do people gravitate to me because they want to know what I think about what's going on? Or do they avoid me assiduously? Uh, and uh, do I have to drink alone in the corner? And I'm drinking a lot more alone. Uh, it's just like Pew had, Pew uh, Research Center, and they do excellent work. Uh, it's, uh, this is, that was a dreadful debate last night. I'm not gonna talk about the first one. People tuned in out of curiosity and it's old news to say the least. But the one last night was, was dreadful, uh, eminently forgettable. There were a few lines that people will recall, but it won't make any difference in terms of their evaluation of the candidate. And it's, it's much more than the debate. Amy, I know you heard the same thing I heard after 2016 and Trump got in. We'll never make this mistake again. We're going to have uh, a consolidation of uh, the anti-Trump candidates and the anti-Trump vote in the Republican Party. And there's no way he can get in again as we move toward uh, 2024. And of course, they've made precisely the same mistake again. And so you have five, six, seven candidates. I don't know how many will survive for how long, uh, but they're splitting whatever anti-Trump vote there is. And even that formulation doesn't explain it fully because what's really happened is the Republican party is not totally different, but substantially different than it was even when Trump won the first time or ran the first time in 2016. This is a party uh, that very much follows Trump. I'm not going to call it a cult. Feel free to if you'd like to. But it is a Donald Trump party. The Republican Party that I grew up with, um, and uh, we were kidding before we came on, I was born under Truman, so I'm the oldest. Uh, but the Eisenhower Party, the Nixon Party, the Jerry Ford Ronald Reagan, how ironic was it that they were at the Reagan Library arguing uh, that we should not, or at least some of the Republicans, arguing that we should not give money to Ukraine and hurt Putin. I, uh, Reagan, Reagan really was spinning in his grave. It was right there. He had to have heard it. Uh, just so strange how the Republican Party has changed. And it's, it's reasonable to ask this question. Can they govern? Is it, is it any more a party that can govern? If you look at what's going on in the House of Representatives on the edge of shutting down the government, whether they do or don't, it looks like they're going to, but even if they don't, the fact that we're right on the precipice of this disaster and you've got enough members, a hardcore right-wing group in the Freedom Caucus, even more conservative than the average in the Freedom Caucus, who are saying, um, Hey, it's okay. We don't need the government. You know, nobody will miss that. We're the heroes here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to make everybody else bend to our will. Uh, we can talk about that more if you want to, but it's, it's disturbing. We, we now have one party that can govern, doesn't always govern well, but it governs. It can get it together, the Democratic Party. And we have the other party uh, that is peddling what can only be described as an anti-democratic creed. Uh, so many of them believe in my leader, right or wrong. It's not my country, right or wrong. It's my leader, right or wrong. Uh, so I haven't gotten into the future because I'm already depressed enough just talking about last night and today. But we can, once we get to the questions, I suppose we'll get to what is likely or not likely to happen. Let, let me just ask you a quick follow-up and then Gideon, I'll come to you. Uh, does it change, do things change a lot when we get through this primary season and you start to look at a general um, extended race? I mean, does the, does the 
the part of the party that you are telling us the story about, does it sort of become diffused in the context of a general election in terms of um, not the candidate per se, but um, which obviously we can't know, but we have an expectation, um, but in terms of the broader politics or who turns up or how they move or shift the candidate. Is there any, is there any room that you, any story in which you can tell a return to some more normal form of politics that's analytically serious? Well, no, that would be my quick answer, very unlikely. Look, we're in a very partisan time and the partisanship is significant because Donald Trump could not possibly have won in 2016 had the Republicans who were offended by him and didn't like him and thought he would make a bad president, had they not returned and voted for him. They did it because he had an R next to his name. That's all you need. You need the letter R or the letter D and you've defined 90 to 95 percent of the electorate, no matter what they say now, no matter what they say a month before the election, no matter what scandals are released, uh, no matter how many convictions we find Donald Trump uh, is going to suffer. Uh, it's not going to make much difference because of the party labels and the partisanship, the extreme partisanship that we see. Now, are any people persuadable? Yes, of course. The true independents are not the group that you see. The real number of independents or the real proportion of independents is really, depending on how you define it, between five and 10 percent of the vote. But of course, elections are decided by a couple of percent in most cases, and this ought to be reasonably close. So that's what we think we see 13 plus months before the election. Uh, now, among independents, the truth is when you examine them even more closely, you find that about a third of them are uh, democratic leaning. And in this era, they end up voting democratic the vast majority of the time, and the vast majority of them vote Democratic. About a third of them are Republican leaning. They end up voting Republican because in the end, their partisanship drags them into a party that they may not like or fully trust. But you've got a third of the independents left. It's, you know, 3%, 4%, 5% of the electorate. They're the ones that probably will decide the election. They usually decide a lot of elections, but this one in particular, and they're, they've got a tough choice to make if it's if it's Bush versus uh, Trump. They've got a tough choice because, let's be honest, neither neither candidate is perfect, and uh, we all have our preferences, and we all think uh, one of them rather than the other is more dangerous than the other. Maybe our group differs on that, but but uh, I certainly don't. Anyway. Yeah. Biden they're going to decide. Trump. They're going to decide which way to go, and they will probably determine the election. Thank you. I think I'm sure we're going to get some questions relevant to your home state about Glenn Youngkin and other things that could bubble above the surface. And I have no doubt that you can give us the kind of knowledge that we just don't have over here. But I'm, let me turn to you, Gideon. You watch America very closely. You watch it from around the world, not just from here in the UK. You write about it. You've written some pretty tough columns um, on what to expect and, and what to be concerned about. What What is your reaction, both listening to, to Amy and Larry, but also um, from your travels and your watching the Republican Party in its current form? What does yeah. it hold for? Well, for I mean, just quickly on the debate, I almost felt sorry for people in that debate. I mean, it, it's a demeaning thing to go through. It's almost impossible to come out of it looking anything other than sort of soil by the process you don't get a chance to say anything at any length everybody's throwing mud at each other talking over each other and as well as being demeaning it's also futile because as we know trump is 50 you know hugely ahead so the they're not even going to get gain anything for the process they went through and uh you know i think the only people who might have uh, benefited a little bit would be the democrats because they provided some lines so it's possibly useful that DeSantis said well actually inflation is you know partly Trump's fault you know I hope somebody was noting that down for the general election but yeah I mean I, I but obviously the big picture is that Trump has this huge lead and so we assume that he will get the nomination I mean I had a scintilla of doubt planted in my mind when I you know read the latest court case and him losing control of his businesses in New York you have to wonder whether one of these legal cases 
will in some way or another bring him down. It's such a bizarre situation that he faces 91 criminal indictments as well as this other civil case that's just come through. Uh, so that has to be a question mark of some sort. But I think the central assumption is still Trump gets the nomination. And now we're into a general election, where, as you say, it's neck and neck. And then there's the, the ABC or well, the Washington Post poll, which said it's, it's a Trump landslide. And everybody's saying that can't be right, including the Washington Post. But um, but it's very, all elections now are super close. And there's, I mean, I was very interested to hear Larry saying even the independents aren't that independent. So it comes down to a very small group of people. But I think the big question, certainly for foreigners and people sitting outside, is, you know, Larry said he wouldn't quite call this a, a cult a party, but invited us to. So, OK, I'll call the Republican Party a cult. I mean, but how come that 50 percent of the American people are going to vote or are around 50 percent look like they're going to vote for Donald Trump, despite the fact that he, as far as I can see, attempted a coup d'etat, uh, you know, for three or four years ago and has all these other things against him. That is the the fascinating and unsettling question about the United States. What is what inspires this loyalty? What do these people want? And then you say for the outside world, you know, what does that mean? Let's say Trump comes back in. You know, you could come up with a comforting story and say, well, the world just about survived four years of Trump before, so you know, fine, uh, we'll just kind of get through it. Or you have the, you know, no, Trump will be much more radical next time around. He might pull America out of NATO in foreign, you know, he might he might cut the Ukrainians off on day one. Uh, and what if America plunges into a kind of, not actually a civil war, but, but such a state of d dysfunction that its whole alliance system and all the people who look to the United States around the world to help them in an increasingly dangerous world with Russia on the march, China threatening to invade Taiwan, uh, say, well, you know, uh, America's not there for us anymore. At that point, I think the whole world is in danger. Okay, that was really grim. Um, I, I, I will say, you know, America is a complex place with multiple actors, many states, a lot of institutions. If one person can take it down, that will be a, certainly a heroic figure, not in a good way. But I want to ask a quick question before we come to a few of the uh, questions from the audience. And it's about polarization. Um, because really, you know, if we are as polarized uh, as we're led to believe, then it is true that, you know, you can't really talk about issues because nobody's movable, right? People are kind of locked into their positions. And it, as Larry said, it's, you know, are you an R or a D? Um, Amy, do you know how much we saw those, you know, we've seen kind of the data as they've changed according to Pew um, during the Trump years where by different measures, polarization became much worse. I don't know if any of the panelists, if you or, or Larry or Gideon know, has that changed? Has it gotten, you know, has there been any sign that polarization is moderated? Is there anything that influences polarization or is, has it gotten worse? Has it just stopped? Gotten Not worse. worse. Yeah. Go ahead, no, I mean, Larry and I will both point, I'm sure to the same Pew study uh, where they look, uh, going back to 1994, the percentage of people who say they're Democrats uh, let me say it this way. People who identify as Democrats, how do you feel about Republicans? Republicans, how do you feel about Democrats? And in the 90s, you know, a small percent said, I feel very unfavorably, maybe 15, 20 percent about the other side. Now it's up to 60 plus percent, very unfavorably. And you say, well, what changed between 1994 and, and now? And Let's be clear, this didn't just start, it wasn't like 1994 and then all of a sudden 2016 comes and it goes straight up. It had been gradually going in this direction already. Uh, so uh, Trump was not the catalyst, but he certainly put a lot of fuel on a fire that was already burning. I mean, you, you can't help but say it's this, right? I mean, the rise of after the 90s, you know, you do see a pretty big spike starting around 2000 with the real engagement of the internet and cable news sort of feeding uh, into that human instincts of being, you know, you're on my team or you're, you're my friend or you're my enemy. And both of these uh, things are, are designed to, uh, to help polarize and engage and enrage. And so we don't disagree more on issues than we have. 
We just don't like each other. Well, We're not I think, the only country in the maybe, world that has social media. Um, so right. yes, a big part of the problem. But Larry, do you what your take on oh, that? I, that's exactly what I was just going to say. I agree with what Amy is suggesting here, but you have to add in social media. It has made everything so much worse. And don't tell me about all the good things it does. I know about the good things it does. But it has really heightened the disagreements and the viciousness of politics, the immediacy of the viciousness, so that uh, whatever people felt before, they now feel it much more strongly because they are fighting the other, the other. I grew up at a time when there was partisanship, certainly. There was a lot of partisanship in 1960 between Kennedy and Nixon, but in the end, both sides got together. And even after Kennedy's failed Bay of Pigs, which was originated by Eisenhower, so that's why it was bipartisan. But even after that, he soared to 80 percent. The vast majority of the Republicans backed him. Part of it's the Cold War, uh, but part of it was that Americans had a framework for semi-unity. You're never going to have a diverse country being truly unified. Maybe 9-11 is an exception. But you will at least have a framework for coming together uh, in crisis or sometimes for great goals that the society is trying to achieve, like, say, going to the moon. Um, and we, we're just not there anymore. There's such intense hatred uh, on social media, but also off social media. Everywhere you go, you experience it. The, the nastiness comes through in lots of ways, including email and, and phone calls and all the rest of it. And, and when you go and do public forums, people will stand up and start screaming. This, to me, this is new. And I've been doing this since the 60s. This, this is new and it's much worse. And what do you do about it? I don't have a clue. I'm hoping that uh, our other two guests will tell me what we need to do and I'll spend the rest of the day doing it. Okay, Gideon, before I come back to you, I'm gonna take the first question. Uh, and it's from Mark Malik Brown. If you introduce yourself and please, um, Anar is gonna give you the floor. The assumption of the panel is that this election is about Trump for the Republican cult, isn't it about Biden and his shortcomings? Noticeably, notably his old and status quo when that Hall of the electorate want this to be a change election. So Mark Malik Brown is asking the Biden question. Uh, Why don't we start with you, Gideon, on that? Yeah, just a quick one. I think that they would find a reason to hate whoever the Democrat was. And in fact, one of Biden's strengths in the last election was he was sort of difficult to hate. He was a you know normal inverted commas. He was an older white guy. He wasn't somebody you know, like an Obama who naturally irritated people because he was a sort of liberal black guy. Um, so, you know, they found stuff, Hunter Biden, whatever, but there'd always be something because for the reasons that Larry says, that people are in uh, in such deep uh, state of polarization. I mean, that said, obviously, Biden's age is a, is a problem and it's weighing on on the electorate. And I thought it was interesting that Biden addressed it directly recently and said, you know, I understand people have these reservations about my age and he's going to have to find a way to do it. But in a way, in a funny, rather hair raising way, the actual process of the campaign will be a huge testing ground, because I think there's a question in all of our minds, you know, how will Biden put up with the uh, exigencies of a campaign? I mean, last time he was able to, because of COVID, basically campaign from his basement, which probably suited him, but he's going to have to be flying around the country, be very energetic. I wince every time I see they fly him to the other side of the world, to Indonesia for, you know, 48 hours and back. Uh, it's it's draining stuff. Um, and obviously Trump is, is not that young. He's only three years younger, but somehow he seems more vigorous. Although, you know, some of the ways Trump speaks, but it's always been sort of discounted. He is rambling. I mean, if, if, if Biden strung together a number of... It, non sequiturs that Trump does, you know, people would be hammering him for being senile. But somehow Trump can do that. And everyone says, oh, that's just Trump, you know. Larry or Amy, do you want to, it would be good to hear your reactions to this question about um, President Biden. Well, a, that's a combination, obviously. You, you've got an incumbent president and the immediate past president. <laughs> we, have, we haven't had that since 
since uh, 18, uh, 1892, when uh, former President Grover Cleveland, who was defeated by Benjamin Harrison, came back against Harrison and won again. I hate to bring that up for the people who don't like Donald Trump, because that suggests Trump might win, and he might win. It's, I think after 2016, uh, we're all uh, more hesitant to make any kind of uh, predictions. I try to make predictions uh, around uh, 9 or 10 p.m. on Election Day. Uh, that tends to be a little bit safer unless there's massive fraud. Uh, but look, Biden's problems are obvious. Uh, the one he can't fix, nobody can fix it. I wish I could fix mine, is age. Uh, it, it does have an impact. And Gideon is so right. I, I also hold my breath every time Biden travels the world and is put through a schedule that frankly would kill me and I'm nine years younger. Uh, yes, I worry about it. I think everybody worries about it, not because, well, some people worry about it because they don't like Kamala Harris. That's certainly, I'm not in that category. I worry about it because it's traumatic for a country to lose a president like that. But also the fact of the matter is that this would in some ways raise Trump to an even higher level and potentially enable him to win that second term. So look, I, Biden has his problems, and I don't even think, Hunter Biden's for the Republican base, No, and so is this impeachment thing. It's just ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. Misinformation matters as much as information. Non-facts matter as much as facts. It's We're in a crazy, upside-down, Alice in Wonderland world, and we had better do something about it instead of just talking about it be good to get before we finish this call your concrete views on what could be done that's actually politically viable and realistic um let's go to mary jane fox so i'm very curious um well i'm glad that biden was mentioned just now but um under the current circumstances what do you recommend to be the best approach for Biden and the Democratic Party? Should the focus be on the person or the party or a little bit of both? Or how do you see it? Thank you. Uh, good, <clears throat> good question. So look, every election is a referendum and usually it's a referendum on the party in power. That makes perfect sense. Do, do you want four more years of this or not? Um, where Democrats have been successful since the rise of Trump is they've turned pretty much every single election since 2016 to being a referendum on Donald Trump and what they call the, the MAGA movement. And so it turned 2018 into a pretty big route for uh, Democrats taking back the House. 2020, not a route, but still successful in, in uh, turning over the White House from Trump to Biden. And then in 2022, turned a midterm election, which is supposed to be all about the party in power, which was Democrats, into a referendum on MAGA. Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot, and yet Donald Trump was on the ballot. He was the sort of center of attention. Part of it is he made himself the center of it by his involvement in specific races, endorsing candidates, going on the campaign trail. And of course, he was part of the conversation because of things that were happening around him, like uh, the Mar-a-Lago uh, FBI investigation. So um, look, if, if you were the Republican Party right now, you'd look at both the polling and the reality of the situation and say, boy, it's pretty clear what our message needs to be in this upcoming election. We have an 80-year-old president who is presiding over a, an economy that is struggling. People are feeling very anxious and pessimistic. Yes, inflation has gone down, but it is still taking a bite out of people's uh, daily, uh, it, you know, their day-to-day their -day lives are impacted by rising costs or costs that are not coming down on the things they need to uh, live their lives. So we're gonna make this a referendum on an economy that's stuck and isn't going anywhere and it's Joe Biden's fault, easy peasy, there we go, it's done. Except that you've got Donald Trump in the background 
right? And he is, it is not just Donald Trump. You're gonna hear, by the way, uh, for our, our for you ask the question, uh, if you wanna know what the strategy is gonna be, watch today as Joe Biden makes a speech directly addressing that issue, uh, much like he did in 2022, where he frames the election as really an existential fight between the forces of democracy and those who wanna undermine democracy. And that is both about Donald Trump as the person, but also a movement that surrounds Donald Trump or candidates like Donald Trump. Um, so when you ask, well, what's the strategy? How are they going to be putting uh, this into practice? What is this gonna look like? It'll look very similar to what uh, we will hear today um, in Arizona from, from Joe Biden. Thank you. Um, let me bring in the question that Lou Lukens asked, because it's one I think that many people are curious about. Um, and it's for you, Larry, about Glenn Youngkin. What game is he playing? How many people are waiting or hoping for him to get in? I mean, donors. And do you think he might get engaged? And how would that change things, if at all? Well, it's awfully late. If he were going to run, he should have announced before now. I, it's obvious what he's doing. He's hoping that the opponents to uh, to Trump, although he's not anti-Trump, he's been with Trump and he said a lot of good things about Trump. He won't criticize him. He has never once criticized Donald Trump. He's never really criticized January 6th. You can't get anything out of him. And people say, oh, that's so smart. That way he could run and have the support of everyone. Not in today's Republican Party. They're suspicious of people who don't take a stand and haven't decided which side they're on. Um, and, you know, once people actually dive into a race, you find out a lot more about them. <laughs> in Virginia, we certainly didn't find out much about Glenn Youngkin during the year he ran for governor, uh, partly because of uh, COVID, partly because of what was happening in, in Washington. It was much more absorbing than uh, what was happening in this particular state. Um, so look, yes, he is back. His base, let me tell you something. Here's his base. His base is private equity, hundred millionaires and billionaires. Oh, and Rupert Murdoch, did I mention him? Rupert Murdoch supports him. So big money, uh, they promised him the world if he runs. The, no question, he will be extremely well-funded. And he's tempted to do it because he's extremely ambitious. This is his first public office. He's never served in public office. He's run exactly once. He won that narrowly. It was a 51% victory. He's been in office for a year and a half. Uh, yeah, I am so old fashioned. I actually believe that experience is important. And I apologize for that because clearly that's, I'm not in tune with the, uh, the uh, trends of today. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> And do I think he might be able to do it? I can construct a scenario for anybody. Uh, and he has some assets that might be of benefit. But by the time he decides to run, which he can't do until the Virginia legislative elections are over, both the state Senate and House of Delegates are up. The Republicans have the House of Delegates very narrowly. The Democrats have the state Senate very narrowly. He'd have to win both of them. He can't just win one. He'd have to win both houses to have a rationale, really, for getting in. He's more or less said that. But by then, you already would have missed some filing deadlines, and others would be very, very close, and it'd be very difficult to uh, fulfill the requirements of filing. So I think he's running in 2028. That's a given. No question about it. <laughs> He's running and he'll, he'll have an early organization. He'll have all the money in the world. So he's more about 2028 because even if Trump's elected, unless he decides to defy the constitution, and I wouldn't put it past him, yeah. uh, he'll be out in four years. Let me come to this question by Ian Bong because it's certainly one that, that uh, those um, of, of, who are members of Chatham House and all over Europe and, and the UK are very concerned about. And, and Ian at the Center for European Reform writes, most of congressional GOP has voted to keep helping Ukraine 
Trump is vocally against that, what will the GOP message in 2024 be? Is everyone actually going to rally to Trump's line? Because, it, you know, there was a debate last night. Not everybody was on the same. You know, there were, there were a range of views on Ukraine. Nikki Haley being on a very different side from Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, we know where Trump is. Um, how how will this change things? Gideon, do you have a view on this before we come? Well, to yeah, my, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to be corrected by people much closer to it. But my assumption is the GOP will fall in line behind whatever Trump says, because uh, if you remember, the manifesto last time was more or less we support Donald Trump. They they didn't even put out a full program. It's it is a sort of personality cult, and so if they're prepared to stomach, as I say, an attempted coup d'état, not distance themselves from Trump, why would they go to bat for Ukraine when they wouldn't go to bat for the American democratic system? Um, so I think, you know, but I might be surprised because I mean I do think that there are. Republicans who do feel very strongly about it. I met, you know, a bunch of Republican senators at the Munich Security Conference who were telling me, you know, the freedom of the world is on the line in Ukraine and we're with them, etc. So maybe, oddly enough, some of them would say this is the issue on which I break with Trump. But on past records, I don't believe it. So I think uh, the only thing that might switch it is if at some point somebody gets to Trump, somebody he trusts and persuades him it's you know, it's a good idea to keep supporting Ukraine for a while. That's, I suppose, conceivable. But my guess is that he would wind down support for Ukraine pretty quickly. Disagreements with that, Larry, Amy? Well, it's not going to be the focus of an election. We only decide elections on foreign policy issues when we have American troops at stake, when we have lives at stake. So I don't think there'll be, there'll, there'll be lots of editorials about Ukraine, and I'm not saying it's not important, it's a very important issue, but that is not how Americans vote, and they're not going to vote on that this time either. It's going to, this one will be personality driven, and I hope democracy driven, uh, rather than focusing on anything beyond the economy, maybe, and a couple other things, but it's not going to be Ukraine. Amy? I do think there is a, there, there still is a significant percent of the elected officials, especially those in the Senate, who not only come from the, um, I, I guess, Reagan-esque uh, wing of, of the party, but at least at their core, while they may have support for, well, they may support Donald Trump, they do sort of see themselves as more hawkish and 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 it's a real it's an it's it's an honest and good to goodness divide within the party. Now it wouldn't matter if Trump wins and then is able to basically veto anything that may come out of the Congress. If that's what he wants to to do, he can absolutely do that. So you're right. I mean, what what he decides is going to be consequential. But I don't know that he's going to get. Uh, unanimous support around him on this issue. Certainly folks in the Republican leadership, not talking about the House leadership, but Senate leadership, um, and uh, many even in the House who are in the foreign policy committees are not supportive of what Trump is asking. So there's a lot to unpack there. And even, you know, over, I guess, one thing I'm sure that everybody's kind of will be interested in is what happens in the House and with the Republicans, even up to the election on, on this question of Ukraine. Um, may, let me also ask, there are two questions here about, one is about the question of violence surrounding an election and whether we might see more of that or whether 2022, the midterm elections gave us cause for hope. Um, and another one is about the race and ethnicity question. There was a sense among, I mean, there's you know, ongoing debate about whether whether the support for Trump was about inequality and and low income workers, or whether it was about culture and race and white nationalism. Um, how do you see these questions playing out? This question of ethnicity and race, and the question of violence over the next over the election period. Larry and Gideon. All right. Well, I I happen to be sitting about 30 yards from the lawn at the University of Virginia where neo-Nazis 
marched down hundreds of them uh, here in Charlottesville uh, in August of 2017, encouraged in many ways by Donald Trump, who then, of course, made his famous statement about there are good people on both sides. Now, I've never met a good neo-Nazi. I guess I haven't lived, but I've never met a good neo-Nazi. Uh, anybody who isn't concerned about violence in our election system here is not paying attention and not being responsible. They're not contributing to the solution. The number of death threats and threats of violence against public officials all the way down to the little electoral boards in each city and county across the entire United States has skyrocketed. Ask the FBI, ask local uh, police about it. This, this is a very dangerous thing and it could explode given the right set of circumstances in an election, which really, let's say Donald Trump is the nominee. Well, there are only two possible outcomes. Either he wins or there was massive voter fraud. And you will have at least some, I hope it's minimal, but I doubt it, violent reaction among his key supporters and the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and all these crazy uh, neo-Nazi groups that are out there and participated in January 6th. You better believe it's a serious issue. And, and you have to talk about it. You can't pretend it isn't there because it very much is. Racial, uh, I'm gonna answer the racial question too because un, social issues are very divisive. We all know, you know, abortion, though that's favoring Democrats, loads of other social issues are playing a role in American politics and dividing Americans even more than they used to. Uh, but it's more than that. One reason why Trump gets so much support from particularly white male non-college voters, and that include and women also are included. He carries women, white women non-college, but he really has an enormous majority among male non-college uh, voters. The reason is because they sense that their group is losing power. There are Democrat, uh, demographic shifts in the United States that no one's going to turn around long, long term. You can close the border all you want, but it isn't going to change the uh, basic uh, mix up of the uh, basic mix of the uh, American population. We're headed toward majority minority in the United States, probably sometime in the 2040s. This is deeply disturbing to this hard rock Trump group. And you ignore it at your peril and our peril. Gideon, I'm going to ask you the UK question, and then I'll come to you, Amy. How is this influencing? Um, uh, Natasha Victor has written specifically alt-right narratives from certain MPs in the UK. And maybe I would generalize that out to say, you know, across Europe, what, what impact is America's domestic politics and specifically what Larry has just told us about had on the right, the far right, the alt-right across Europe? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I think there is a whole bunch of people in Europe who are looking towards Donald Trump and uh, would take his re-election as an inspiration. I mean, it's easy to say uh, Europe looks on in horror as, but of course, Europe has its own, you know, local variants of uh, whatever you want to call it, far right, populist, nationalist. We know roughly what we're talking about. There is, for example, I mean, Viktor Orban has sat out the last four years. Um, you know, he's now being fined by the EU, but he's just waiting for Trump to come back in. And he's not a, a, a lone figure in the EU. This weekend, Slovakia may elect an Orban-like figure in Robert Fico. The Polish government is pretty, uh, you know, of that ilk. Uh, Georgia Maloney in Italy, so far everyone's saying, phew, she's not so bad, you know, she's more moderate than we thought. But, you know, she's she's a, an admirer of, of Le Pen, of, of Orban, um, and she too, I think, would increasingly look to make an alliance with Trump in the way that, say, Bolsonaro in Brazil did. Rather, and, and a lot of these guys, and Maloney's a woman, their rhetoric is anti-Brussels, um, and they, so they're looking for an alternative vision. And, and some of the stuff that Trump talks about resonates in Europe, you know, particularly the things that Larry was talking about, white fear of mass immigration, we're losing our country, uh, we don't control our borders, complete read across from Mexico to the Mediterranean. So those views, um, you know, at the moment, 
you know, that Biden came in and it looked like the, the wind would go out of the sails of that group in Europe. But if Trump comes back in, there's a following wind behind them. And does that lead you, let me just press you on this before I come to Amy, does that lead you, what does that lead you to think in terms of policy prescription? Does it mean that Rishi Sunak, um, the conservative party is being intelligent and sensible and having a particular approach to migration that's less likely to trigger a backlash? From Look, a I mean, I think, I, I don't know what you do about uh, about that particular issue. I don't think you can just say, um, well, you know, it's being blown out of all proportion. People shouldn't care about it. The fact is uh, that people, a, a significant amount of the electorate do care about it. Um, but how you fix it, I don't know. But I think that more broadly, British foreign policy would be in a very, very difficult place. Because if you take Ukraine, you know, we put all our chips on we're the big supporters of Ukraine. We're even further out there than the United States. We're bolder than America. Now, what if, uh, you know, we just left the EU, so we're reliant on the special relationship with the United States. What if the US turns on a dime and says, oh, we don't believe in that anymore? You know, we would just have to follow, I think. We're, but it but it would be, you know, it, we would, I was just at a foreign office seminar a while back and said, you know, one of the things you should be thinking about is what the hell do we do if Donald Trump is reelected? And the people there said, yeah, yeah, we weren't prepared enough for that in 2016, but we were definitely starting work on that right now. But then, you know, the question is, Trump is so unpredictable and also could turn so much of the sort of bedrock assumptions about the transatlantic Atlantic Alliance, you know, could invert them, destroy them, that, that I don't really know how you prepare for that, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Amy, this question yeah. of voice. Um, uh, Gideon, that is a, such a good point about how to prepare for it because um, just thinking through who would be in a Trump government mm -hmm. um, is, you know, you've got uh, folks who, what percent of them now have books out uh, from their time in the, in the Trump administration, uh, criticizing Trump, talking about the dysfunction there, saying they would never ever go back. They're endorsing other candidates for president. Um, the uh, Donald Trump saying he's going to root out the deep state. I mean, it's it is the 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 kinds of people who will want to be part of the Trump world and the kind of people that will be willing to go into that. Uh, raises a whole lot more questions um, about sort of what the the stability of uh, uh, that uh, you know that that administration. Um, so that's a whole other. Uh, it, I mean, Gideon's right. Sort of like I don't know if we can really think through that now. We just kind of have to get through where we are uh, at this moment in in time. I will say to the, um, I think one of the questions, you, there was the violence question, but there was also, oh, the, the issue about the, the sort of, is this a cultural issue or is this um, an economic issue? And um, the, just the academic research that I've seen on this, and Larry knows a lot more about it than I do, but it's it's been pretty well documented that the issue is not, we like to talk about the working class, this is as like a class issue, the more money you have, uh, the more likely you are to, you know, to, to think of liberal democracies or to be more open to voting for somebody like Biden, the less money you have, you're going to be attracted to a populist like Trump. That's really not it at all. The, the driving factors in determining whether someone is going to be more attracted to somebody like Trump or more attracted to somebody like Biden is you know, one, do you define yourself as even, are you white? Do you find yourself as evangelical? Um, uh, so evangelical white voters, whether they have a college degree, whether they have lots of money, whether they have no money, wherever they are, they are voting overwhelmingly for Trump. And uh, the other uh, the other piece is really, it's an, we talk about it as it's not about money, it's about how you define yourself in relation to, as Larry pointed out, other, uh, the, the, the sort of um, uh, diversification of the country, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and you're, 
whether you have a college degree, it's not necessarily whether you're making more money or not. There are a lot of people without a four-year college degree who are doing very, very well. So this is not so much about whether the economy is doing well or not doing well, or people who are suffering economically or the people who don't have the level of education. No, this is a, a cultural fight more than it is an economic fight. Um, when we talk about who's, you know, who's doing well and, and who's do, and who's not. Donald Trump went to Detroit ostensibly to link arms with the striking workers uh, from UAW, but that's not who he was speaking with in Detroit. He went to a, a, a shop that, that provides um, parts for the car companies. It's a non-union shop. And who he was speaking to are folks, not necessarily those who are part of trade unions, what he's saying is you should come to me because I'm the only one that's gonna protect you from the real threat. The real threat is China. The real threat are the outsiders. The real threat are from people who wanna change this country, right? It's, it's not, let's not get into a debate about how much money you're making an hour, how many hours you're going to have to work in a week. It's the fact that these people come in here and they tell you we need to have electric vehicles and then China's going to eat our lunch while we try to make these stupid cars that, you know, <laughs> that can't drive anywhere because they run out of battery. It's that's what we need to fight against much more so than a, than a sort of traditional fight over who's getting the fruits of the labor. Amy, that was uh, tremendous for us and our audience because we spend a lot of time thinking about the United States, Europe, and China. And there were a couple of questions about China and you've tied it in uh, very eloquently in an in a, um, unsettling but, but powerful way. Um, we are at four o'clock. I know everybody has somewhere to go. Larry, I know you've got a deadline. Thank you so much, Amy, Larry, and Gideon. Um, please follow their work, Cook Political Report, um, the Crystal Ball, and the Financial Times. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, this will be recorded and you can look back, but we will carry on many of the elements from this conversation and the questions that we didn't get to, we'll be sure to address on our next session. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye, you, everybody. everyone.